Welcome to the Chelsea FC podcast, Mr. Ken Bates. How's it going? Slowly. <laughs> so, what was it Just like? Just finished a lo- lovely lunch with all the girls behind the scenes, Suzanne and I, with all the girls behind the scenes at Chelsea, who made it work. And there were so many people behind the scenes, weren't there? Oh, there were. But it's the same in anything. Top people get all this and that and the other, blah, blah. But the real work is done below, which the public never know about, which is understandable. Like in politics, the politics do all the talking, the civil servants bug up the country. And who was the fellow you was talking about at your dinner? Uh, Bob the Brush, was it? Oh, Bob, the big boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, he swept, he swept the dirt, he swept the yards around Chelsea Village. All the, the he did it. He was just as important as a manager, because otherwise we wouldn't have a clean Chelsea Village. And you have to recognise that and give them the credit they're due, which we always tried to do. We always tried to run the club as a family. Yeah, and you said you said it's like a pyramid, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you think, well, another thing is like an iceberg. The bit you see at the top that you see is the public pier, but all the rest of the work is below. Oh, it's like a swan. See the swan gliding along. It's beautiful, isn't it? But below the waves, the feet are going like this. That's what those girls out there today, they were the feet. Thank you very much. This is our enemies get together and the other the great days we can all set up and yeah. What was the club like when you first arrived, Ken? First of all, so many so-called experts and first said, I chased Brian Mears to buy the club from him. Not true. Brian Mears had been sacked by the board about six months before I came on the scene. What actually happened, the man who was trying to sort out Chelsea was a chartered accountant called Martin Spencer. And I had business dealing with him about two or three months earlier when we were buying a company. He was a receiver of a company. We were buying one of the assets from it. And we did the deal quietly, simply, and went through. And uh, so we got to know each other. About a month or so later, he rang me and said, Ken, I've another one you might be interested in. I said, what's that? He said, well, Chelsea Football Club. So I met him, we had a discussion. And of course, I knew Brian Mears previously. I met them purely by chance. I knew Malcolm Allison very well, who was the great city manager in the, the old city. And uh, he was then managing Crystal Palace. We went across to see him his guests and were a bit noisy and people laughing and joking and a lady said can we I'll be introduced to that couple over there so we brought up the juniors became friends so we used to go to Chelsea sit in the director's box and the year they got relegated I wrote, got a check out my bank checkbook out and gave Brian a check for £16,000 that was a lot of money in those days I said, I'll sponsor all your home games against London clubs next season, which I did. And typical of when I turned up the day, on the day that I sponsored it, the restaurant manager knew nothing about it. First of all, refused me a table and then finally found one next to the kitchen. Anyway, he, uh, Martin, asked me if I was interested. Chelsea. Yeah, I didn't know how much trouble it was in till he told me. So we were all going to, they needed 300. What had happened is the bank manager, Lord Chelsea, or Viscount Chelsea was now, he was in the Earl of Cadogan. I think he died this year. Um, he was on the board, as was David Mears, Martin Spencer, the man they brought in to help them out, another man, I don't remember his name. And it was organised for a meeting at, uh, 
on the Friday night before a home game. They were playing Oldham, fun enough. Um, and apparently the bank manager had enough. And he rang up. I'm going to go back a bit, sorry. The previous Saturday, Chelsea, or a couple of weeks ago, Chelsea played Tottenham in the FA Cup. And those, well, it still does. It, it, you know, the Cup is just a one leg competition. And the home club takes all the money. They have to give half of it to the away club. And the bank rang up and said, I've got two checks here, one for the wages, one for the FA. Which one do you want me to bounce? Because he'd had enough. And Lord Chelsea, despite his wealth, he wouldn't prepare to put any money in it either. So that's when they had the meeting, emergency meeting on the Friday night. So I went in, and he went on and on, dragged on and on. And Martin Spencer said, don't worry, it'll, the, the evening will be finished at 7.30. I said, how would you know that? I was on the set. On Friday night, their wives, these, the wives of the lawyers and all the rest of it, would arrange dinner parties. If he's, if they're late, they'll be in trouble. So it goes. didn't make sense to me. Anyway, got the situation. David Muir was dragging on and on. Finally said, oh, excuse, oh, we can't finish this tonight. But I need to put the money in and we'll, uh, we'll complete it next week. I looked at him. So they needed three hundred thousand pounds. I bought the cheque with me. And if you think I'll give you, give you, make a three hundred thousand pound unsecured loan to an insolvent company, and you're in charge of it, you must be bigger woo -woo, than I thought you were. Dead silence. Viscount Chelsea just picked his pen up. Sign it, push it. So, so I've signed it. So somebody else signed it. So Mia's reluctantly signed it. So it was all over. Um, Lord Chelsea said to me, um, "Well, I wonder, would you do me the pleasure of being my guest at the chairman's lunch tomorrow?" I thought that's bloody nice. I'm being invited to be a guest at the club of which I am now the chairman. But knowing my place as a peasant, I said, it's very kind of you, uh, Charles, if I may call you Charles. Oh, yes, sir. So, and we went along to a meeting the next day, on the Saturday, next day, came, and I couldn't believe it. There were 30 people in the ballroom, all the, all the directors, and their families, and their kids, and their friends. And it was a lovely four-course meal, fine wines, champagne, a dessert. And then they brought the brandy round, the best brandy, and port, and Cuban cigars. I looked at this bloody room, I thought, I don't believe this. So, we drew two, too, I think, and hold them. My, one of my previous clubs. <clears throat> anyway, I got in early Monday morning and parked up, said nothing. There's lots of all of them arrived for the work. And you can see an idea of somebody, the way they walk, the way they hold their head. It's something. And anyway, I said, and they had a, one of their excesses, they had a chauffeur. And I uh, but, Chelsea only had one car, which David Mears was using. But apparently, the chauffeur was there. Parking was terrible in 1982 in London. Good job they weren't there today. But um, the idea was the chauffeur would drive any of the Chelsea directors or top managers to any appointments they had in the city or anywhere else. Oh, clearly, nowhere about the parking. Couldn't bring it back. Even if it was nothing to do with Chelsea. If I count. Chelsea was going to a meeting with his state or something. Anyway, so I waited for him. I asked to see him 20 past nine. He 
came running down the east end pulling his jacket on. He said, do you want to see me, Chairman? I said, yes, just go through that door there. Yes, yes, yes. I said, turn left, first right, get your cards. We don't need a chauffeur. So I took it from there. And right. it was an um, interesting start to the era. Yeah. Of course, we're all very grateful for the Chelsea pitch owners. Can you tell us more about it? Well, the older Chelsea fans, what had happened previous under, under Lord Chelsea and the Mears family, who bankrupted the club, they sold Chelsea football ground to a property company in return for lease at a rent. And uh, in fact, they also sold the training ground. And then they used to rent the Imperial College training ground, which meant you had no privacy, no confidentiality, no control. And that was the state I invented. And anyway, people will remember a company called Marlow Estates. And the Mears had a share, got a, then they sold the ground to them. Uh, they got a share in the Marlow Estates. The Marlow Estates, got, I got Marlow Estates into financial difficulties, arguing, 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 fighting every point. They were taken over by Cabaret Estates, which was owned by a tough Irishman called John Duggan. And the fight carried on. Carried on, carried on, carried on. I used every delaying tactic possible to keep us going, fighting them. And, uh, Finally, Cabaret Estates went bust as well. And the money, Cabaret used the money to buy Chelsea from the Royal Bank of Scotland. So the Royal Bank of Scotland now had, oh, they left, left this money. To, so they had a, a bad debt on their hands. So they very cleverly, a man called Bill Samuels, who was one of the greatest savers of Chelsea, he moved the money formed a company and moved the money into the company so the bank no longer had a bad, impending bad debt they just owned a company which they could hide so I remember business with him anyway after all I got, got Chelsea got secure oh great and I was walking uh, walking there there was a crowd around the director's entrance walking through and somebody said yeah that's all right basically what are you going to do when your grandkids flog the bloody company? Flog the club? I mean, I thought, you ungrateful bastard. I've spent X number of years, yeah, fuming. I went upstairs. But the more I thought about it, he was right. Because that's what happened to me, his family. There's an old Lancashire saying, rags to riches to rags in three generations. And it, it's, it's true, often true, because the old man starts with nothing, like me, whatever, build their way up, spoil their kids, the kids take you for granted, spoil their kids because they know nothing else and hey, off they go. Fortunately, I didn't do that with mine. Um, I knew it, the danger was there. That's so I think, yeah, puzzle, puzzle, puzzle. I've been to Ireland and um, the Irish are very loving and patriotic and love the old, old sod as they call it, sod, sod of turf. And whether they're in America or Australia, if their descendants came from Ireland two generations ago, they still love their Ireland. And this guy had the smart idea, he bought four acres north of Dublin, chopped them up into one square foot squares, sold them for a hundred pound each. I own a piece of the old sod, I own a piece of your country. He made a fortune. I thought, he's a guy good. I'll do the same with Chelsea Bitch. Do it with Chelsea Bitch. And then the fans will own the pitch, and the chairman will come and go, and come and go, but nothing to do about it. But my lawyer said, to Ken, you've got to be careful. It won't work. I said, why not? Well, first of all, he said, you're selling land. So you've got 79% VAT. So now it's up to 179. But secondly, you have to pay £12.50 in London to register a piece of land you own, no matter how small it is. So the £100 come down to 
78 pound 50 or something like that. He said, and then your trade in his, his land on you, so you could pay corporation tax. Buggered. Thought, thought, thought. No, we'll form a company. And the company owned the pitch and the fans would buy shares in the company. I thought, yeah, but they can be taken over. So I came up with a complicated system. So I thought that tell CPO, we've got a CPO from now, called CPO, <coughs> and um, when we did the co country, company's constitution, I said nobody associated with Chelsea Football Club could have anything to do with CPO. I know we were CPO and do with Chelsea Football Club. So, uh, CPO was for the fans, the supporters. And no matter how many shares you bought in CPO, you only had one vote. And if you wanted to change any of the rules, and he got a 76% majority, not 51%. And that's how it went. I can say I'm a bit disappointed that the fans haven't taken up as many shares as they should do or should have done because they say they love the club. Well, a couple of hundred quid isn't too much, is it? To own their club and save the ground. Because in the lease, that CPO granted to Chelsea Football Club. CPO owns the, own the name Chelsea Football Club. And they also own the centre spot in the pitch. But one of the one of the conditions of the lease is that the club can only use the name Chelsea Football Club if they play at Stamford Bridge. So if they move to Battersea Power, Wembley or White Hart Lane, have to call themselves Tottenham United or Wembley Wankers or whatever. Not Chelsea Football Club. Of course, it was a to. And it worked because Roman Abramovich tried to take it over twice and failed. All his money, all his professional advisors. So CPO is invincible for the Chelsea fans. So I'll tell them now if you haven't bought a share yet, buy one or more. Make sure to Sanford Bridge is owned forever by the fans. And you'll, because people will all be after it, because it's such a valuable piece of land. Yeah. But it can't be as valuable as it is to generations of Chelsea fans. Yeah, me and my dad have got shares. So. Well done, probably like a couple more. <laughs> Can you tell us the story about Dennis Wise when you signed him and Gwen Williams? Well, Gwen Williams. Uh, underrated man. Um, he was in charge of the youth team and all the rest of it. Also, he was our chief scout and he found a lot of our players. He had so many contacts in Europe and he was really understated, he didn't know anything about it. But, but he got the idea why is he bringing him out of the club? And um, Sam, a man who was then famously owner of Wimbledon, he's a very funny man, um, uh, it's all your family and you this and that and the other, but he was the last hate So when that so wisely, wisely was away, um, he made, there's a clause in the contract, if Dennis left, he got lump sum. And Sam said, well, I'm not going to sign the transfer unless you waive that money. I only found that out later. And a dentist came, got him one and a half million, and uh, he came. It was in the old Chelsea office where I had my office looking out on it. So Green brought him and said, yeah. So he opened the door and in came was he. I looked him up and down and said, bloody hell, do you get much one one and a half million these days, do you? He said, hello, Batesy, how are you? Pretty damn good. So I've Batesy ever since. <laughs> he was a lovely man. In fact, I'll tell you a story about him. Um, he was there when Hoddle was the manager. And Hoddle, I'm afraid, is a bit overrated. 
Because if you think about it, what did he ever win at Chelsea? At Tottenham? Anywhere else? England? Anywhere else? Anything he won, was he won, got Swindon via the playoff final into the Premier League. And we were struggling. And we were just before Christmas. And we were Southampton, nil nil away. And apparently, it's only hearsay. Apparently, Otto said, OK, let's keep playing, do you be all right? And then he said, No, F this. And he knew this, get out, let's get out and kick a few arses. Let's go get stuck into them, will you, brother? And the entire day, like, Yeah, yeah, come on, let's have it. So I to shut up. They went out and they won. We won 2 1 or 3 1. Then the next, because it was the Christmas period, and then we had three games over the Christmas New Year period. And we went to Queen's Park Majors on 2 1 or 3 1 or something it was. Then we finally came back to to Stamford Bridge and won 4 1. And those nine points made us safe. Hoddle never spoke to YG again. I mean, Hoddle and Dennis was playing for England. And when Hoddle became manager of England, he never picked Dennis again. Dennis never played for England again. But Dennis, I mean, Ferguson, I was quite friendly with him, even though they were deadly enemies and adversaries. He said about Dennis, he could start a fight in an empty room. I always remember that. But Dennis was a lovely guy. Go on, let's have you, let's have you, let's have you. Also, he was encouraging. He's a lovely man. Me? Oh wow, you're putting me on the spot now. <laughs> well, you can't stop, can you? No. No, my favourite players, I'd say, probably Jack Franco's over. He's got to be up there because he was one of the best, wasn't he? But there's so many. There's Frank Lampard, there's John Terry. I loved the Ali. I mean, when I was a kid, he was my favourite player. Mm -hmm. Even when he wasn't in the team, I always loved Luca. And I really liked him when he became the player manager. And we won all those trophies, obviously. And Great of, the yeah. of course, we were all saddened to hear of the passing of Gianluca Vialli, a real Chelsea legend. What was he like at Chelsea? We lost 2 1. And I hope it. Bloody hope. He was unfit, doing too much on his commercial things. So I gave Vialli a job. And he took, sat down, apparently, sat them all down in the dressing room, glass of champagne, and said, Get the pass, this is the start, this is the first day of tomorrow. Let's go out and win, lads. He was that kind of a man, he was a gentleman. And they went out and we won 3 1. I, I can't remember but I know the winner came for the right cross from the right wing, so we banged it in and 3 1 win the final. And uh, he was like that. He was a great gentleman, never raised his voice, and quiet. In fact, his Sunday morning routine, he came up to the penthouse, the weather was okay, we sat on the terrace, eating Santa smoked salmon sandwiches, drinking a bottle of champagne. Good friends. What was the reason you sat through to it? Well, the trouble is, um, it's always a bit of a trouble when a manager, when a player becomes a manager because of spotlight. And he and Zola, I don't know, I don't know the details, but I just know that he and Zola thought he should move. And I thought he couldn't, so I'd choose one or the other. But we say good friends and, and Luca, and he contributed. He was our most successful manager. We won the FA Cup, the League Cup. We won the League Cup, that got us into the um, into Europe, won the FA next year, won the FA Cup, and also got us into Europe. And we played. So that year we won the we won the League Cup, the Cup Winners Cup, the Charity Shield, as it was called then. Story about that as well. I tell you one day. Um, and then finally. We won the Cup Winners' Cup, European Cup Winners' Cup, and Real Madrid won 
European Champions League. So we played together for the Championship of Europe. And we played in Monaco, ironically. Real Madrid beat them 1 0. A goal from Gaspoyer, 20 minutes from the end. We were champions of Europe. What a great team, great manager. And uh, I got a letter from the president of UEFA and a letter from the chief general secretary of UEFA, independent letters, congratulating us on Chelsea becoming champions of Europe, welcoming us, welcoming Chelsea to the European elite. And that was the high note. The 90s was such a glorious era for Chelsea. I know the fans will never forget the wonderful football we played. But the other thing about today's football, you know, I get bored with it. It's like ping pong. I was watching uh, Burnley and Everton yesterday, or this week, and Burnley were home, uh, two goals down, ten minutes ago, passing the bloody ball sideways and back to the goalkeeper. He's getting the other side penalty area. Mm. Football is boring. The old English game, you know, shoulder charges, long ball down the wing and cross the ball, excitement. Now it's like a game of ping pong. Yeah, because they pass it on the back for 10 minutes and they yeah. without going. When in. they're down. Yeah. You do it when you're up, you're wasting time, legally, to a point. But uh, you don't do it when you're down, you can get the ball in the penalty area. Yeah, for me, modern football isn't as good. They just pass it along the back for a long time, don't they? I always remember that goal from Frank LeBeouf when he launched it and Viali was one-on-one -on -one with Peter Schmeichel when he put it through his legs. Real football. And Bobby Di Matteo's 43-second oh, yeah. goal in 1997. I, did, I, I heard the, I heard the roar, of, so roar of the crowd, but I didn't actually see it go in. So I wonder what they were cheering about. And then I saw the net rustle and you got it. I bet you weren't the only one to miss it though, to be fair, because mm. it was so early, wasn't it? That was the earliest cup final goal for a long time, wasn't it? It's a record. I think it's just been beaten by a bit, by one person, but oh, yeah. um, oh, Robbie. Oh, he was here on Thursday. Robbie, lovely man. Of course, Gianfranco Zola, the little magician. What's that story you was telling me about Gianfranco and his wife? We were playing Wimbledon, I think it was a hybrid, semi-final the FA Cup, and we, we beat them. And Gwyn Williams came up to me and said, Chairman, got a problem. I said, what's that? He said, uh, well, somebody buggered up the co coach arrangements. We haven't got anything for the players' wives. Can you help us? Oh, bring them in. Cause we had a, you know, the usual 35, 40 senior luxury coach. And so I was sitting, there used to be a first, as you came in the door of those coaches, there used to be, came up, there used to be a table there for four, chair there, seats for four, two front, two back, two facing, two backing, with a table in between. So these two ladies came in and sat down. And uh, I was told, I'd never met them before. I was told she was Mrs. Zola. So Susanna and I sat there in awkward silence, but didn't know how to break it. So, oh, so I could, could take a step backwards. In, it, in Italy, in Europe, in those, particularly Italy, they were much more serious about training and coaching. And before a match, they go into a training camp you weren't allowed out of the training camp, the players. No was allowed in, including wife, girlfriend, nobody. Very strict, fit, but no booze, early nights, the lot. <coughs> so, so, and of course we just got to the final. So, uh, I do what I said. Uh, Mrs. So I said, Oh, I knew her name was Franca. I said, it's your Franca, Mrs. Zola, aren't you? And Susanna said, she said, black eye, eyelashes, went, whoop. And she screwed her. She said, yes. And I said, I didn't know how to break it. I said, you do realise that 
there must be no close physical contact between now and about Wembley. Dead silence. So I thought, Susanna was telling me, she was like, oh my God, what is? Oh my God, what did he say that for? And finally she said, and it is the same for the president. Dead silence, we all fell about laughing. <laughs> so when you inherited John Neal as Chelsea manager, what were those early days like? Well, John, well, I inherited him. And I walked in, and because uh, I'd run a few businesses, so I had a bit of experience. And of course, I was sacking people right, left and centre. And I went into his little office, Sitting in a fag to introduce himself, so he shook hands. Very phlegmatic, our John. I said, John, I don't think about you. But I know you've, you've inherited an empty team. I'm very happy to work with you, give you time to, and support you where I can, if you want. Thank you, Chairman. Going on in I am, which nothing did happen. But he, we got relegated, but I stuck by him. And uh, he actually sorted his team out, what he wanted, what he didn't want. And uh, year later, we got 1984, got promotion on goal difference. And John, well, I'll tell you a funny story about John Drillisley. He, I lived in, I lived in, in uh, <clears throat> Sorry, Chelford St. Peter, he lived a couple of rows down the hill, to the right, so we weren't very far apart. And, uh, you know, Chairman, fancy a bit of scouting tonight. So in midweek, I'd often bugger off together in his car. And, you know, and, um, great. But I'd help, I'd, previous to Chelsea, I'd helped out a mate of mine, Freddie Pye bought a stake in Wigan Athletic and got in a financial mess which I'm afraid my former business partner I knew was his habit so I lent him some money so when I came down to Chelsea they couldn't pay me I said well let it via there they finally did a deal they had three good players there and I thought anyone I said get one of them let's have one of them and we'll ride off the debt so I took John up and when you went with John, you didn't speak to him. He sat there, hunched up, smoking, chain smoking his fag. And Fred, after 10 minutes, said, Who's your fag? Shut up, leave me alone. After that, shut up, leave me alone. Didn't talk to me after. Came in, I said, What do you think, John? I said, That number four from Bournemouth was looking. That number four from Bournemouth that looks useful. <laughs> Months later we bought him. 40,000 quid. I was just back I wrote off the weekend debt. <laughs> but that was John. What were the FA like to deal with? Many of them had little or no commercial knowledge. So they were suckers when the outsiders came in. And, um, oh, for example, the TV contracts were screwed rotten. And on Wembley, I have to go back a bit, but it's weird. But I wanted to do, do the Olympics in Europe after the war, 1948. But most of the capitals in Europe had been devastated. England was the only one that had anything left. And we had Wembley Stadium. So, of course, we got the Olympics. And Jarvis Astaire, who was chairman, I think, or vice chairman of the Wembley Stadium Company, they did a 50-year lease with the FA. It took them to the cleaners. A 50-year lease... And 
the FA had to play all their games there, all the internationals, and also all the FA, any any cup matches and blah blah blah, including the FA Cup final. I thought thirty percent the ghost take. Thirty percent. So somebody said to me years years ago, not so long ago, I said, "What's the first excuse coming into football as a chairman? What's the first thing you have to be to be a successful chairman?" I said, "Unpopular." He said, "Why?" I said, "Well, when you come in, why are you got into the club? It's because it's in trouble, and why is it in trouble?" because it hasn't been run properly. So you make changes. If you make changes, you're unpopular. I'll give you an example. When I took over Chelsea, I, we had 700 complimentary tickets every bloody week, every home game. And yet we were losing money hand over fist. So I made 700 enemies the first week. <laughs> but that's an example, you have to make change. If you could do it all again, Ken, would you? Yeah, I would, but not with Matthew Harding. Do you want to talk about that? Or not really? Well, I just told the girls about it. I'll only say one story. First of all, I mean, the press loved him because I corrected when the press wrote something was wrong, I corrected them in my pro infamous programme notes. And they didn't like it, obviously. So, so Matthew came along, told the old man, well, they flocked to him. And obviously gave him all positive stories. But, um, all the stuff about multi pump millions. What he did, he was a very clever man of what he did, which was insurance, reinsurance broking. And there's a long story there, but I'm not going to tell it tonight. Today, but um, but because he they his company had lots of money always at a certain bank, he could go to them and borrow some of it personally. So he went to the bank and borrowed five million and lent it to us, and we paid the interest. I mean, kiddie hodl, everything was interest free, but that's another story. And that brought them all Sam. But he was desperate to try and get, get me out and get, get, get over, take over. I don't think he had much experience about really running things. Anyway, um, the way I built Stanford, developed Stanford, was in bits and bats and parts. So the next thing to do was do the under. Chelsea had no parking, car parking. So I go to an underground car park, carrying 200 people, but also put in the foundations for the South Stand and the shops and the hotel and the restaurant. So if you get that done, that's the dirty work, you know, the digging, the drilling, taking the muck out, all that kind of stuff. Get that done. Then when we got some more money, we could build on it. And the co-op bank lent me into three million to do it. And um, Suzanne and I were in midweek game at Liverpool got an urgent phone call on my mobile from Michael, come and see me now. I know you'll I'll come off it. No, you won't. Take it out again. Come now. He's really insistent, urgent. Not shouting, but very loudly. And that wasn't Michael at all. So we got, out, got the car and drove there, sat me down. He said, I've had Michael. I did Harding in the, my office this morning. Oh, yeah. yeah. He tried to persuade me to withdraw the loan to Chelsea to put the foundations in and the car park. Well, why is he trying to stop you developing it here? Can't you realise it? Is he gone on a bit acrimonious? Finally, Harding said, if you don't stop that loan, and he found out later he stopped the previous loan, uh, um, I'll put 20 million on deposit with you. A lot of money in those days. Michael Woodward said to him, Mary, Mary, Michael, sorry, Matthew, Chelsea's my client. We are his bank. And I can't discuss my client's affairs with you. If, as you say, you're going to take over Chelsea, then you will be in charge of Chelsea. 
It'll be your decision whether you continue banking with the co-op or you go to somewhere else. For the moment, no, get out. Well, I knew Harding was doing all sorts of things to try and get me out behind the scenes. It would be nice to my face. But I've now got cast iron proof I suspect it's all wrong. So on the next day, no Ken, waiting reaction to Hello Matthew, you alright? Everything okay? Just ignored it. But I never forgot it. And people who now think, you know, Matthew like that, Matthew like that. Let me tell you, he didn't put a penny of his own money in the club. What he did put in, he borrowed and lent to us and we paid interest on it. And I'll tell you one other little story about that. that you know, Matthew got very friendly with Hoddle. Very, very friendly. And Matthew's crazed about buying Matthew Letizia from Southampton. On and on and on. So, and he's winding Hoddle up. So I was like a call ball meeting. So we all sat around there. And he says, Hoddle came. Hoddle sat there. I sat here. Matthew was there. The other director sat around. Okay, Matthew, you keep on about this. Let's, let's talk about buying him. I said, what, what's the transfer fee? 10 million? Yeah, we'll okay, 10 million. Right, okay. What we're going to pay in wages? It'll be monocled a bit. Million, I said million. Right. Million pound. So, right, a million pound a year for his salary, plus his NHI, plus his signing on fee. That's it, but the final said then there's a transfer fee. Ten million plus the interest on that. Hoddle said, What interest? Hoddle said, What do you mean? Well, I said, Well, when Matthew, when you buy a player for ten million pounds and you borrow the cash with Matthew Lenzers, we pay the interest on it. So eight percent. It's 800,000 a year. And Matthew said, and Hoddle said, I didn't know he paid any interest. Dead silence. I looked across from Matthew. And I said, averted my eyes. I said, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So I, I pissed myself laughing. Because here he con Hoddle, Hoddle, Hoddle. Uh, two days later, England, Graham Kelly ran me up, asked me had permission to speak to Hoddle for the England job. I said, yes, of course, Graham. I said, can I ask you a question? He said, what's that? I said, well, because in those days, it was, it was probably still is a law that said, if you approached, if you illegally approached a player coming under contract, then that, that was illegal and you'd be fined and punished and blah, 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 blah. F.A. Law. I said, so, well, Graham, who do I report the F.A. to for breach of their own rules? I said, I know you've been speaking to for three months. Dead silence. I just pissed myself laughing, put a phone down on it. And I think four o'clock, Hoddle rang me over the phone to resign. I said, OK, don't worry, Glenn, I've been waiting for it. I said, by the way, make sure you take your astrology with you, because there's some funny woman that used to predict the future. And, oh, oh. and he went, and what did you do at England? He won nothing, did he? And I had a phone call. I had a message left on the phone uh, Thursday morning. Apologise from the He said, Is Frank Cazola here? Remember me? The little Italian one used to play for you? He said, Just wish you have a happy birthday last week and wish you have a nice time tonight. Sorry I can't come, but I hope you have a lovely time. Thank you very much for everything. That's in two days ago. Lovely. Well, thanks a lot for joining us and thanks for everything you've done for Chelsea, Ken. Oh, pleasure. 
Now let the supporter do the bit. Get those shares bought and get sure your children and your grandchildren buy a few shares. This is a special message to the. I can't remember. I know his name is Alan. Can't remember his surname. Uh, he's written a book called uh, Blue Was the Colour. And I just told him, I've read his bit about me, which includes the usual inaccuracies, but he has been, it claims he has been a Chelsea supporter since his dad took him when he was three years old. Well, you've done very well in all your careers. Congratulations, you've got a few spare, Bob. Put your money where your mouth is and buy some Chelsea pitch owner's shares. On that happy note, cheers. The Chelsea pitch owners was invented to stop somebody rich coming in, buying the football club and selling off the land and making an absolute fortune and forgetting about the football club. So for anybody out there who doesn't know, because apparently online some people don't know, I think all the match going supporters do know this, but Ken Bates saved the football club. He is as big as Roman Abramovich to many Chelsea fans and he doesn't get praised enough. Because if you think of uh, like a Manchester United chairman, owner, how much would have he got praised if he invented a system that helped Chelsea fans preserve where Chelsea Football Club will be playing its football in the future? And I think we all should give Ken Bates a big round of applause because he's a fantastic man and he was a fantastic owner for us. And for me, moving away from Stamford Bridge, never. What he's achieved will grow and grow So he's to setting the wheels in motion Now it never rains on the blue parade As we all stand upon solid ground Sure there's still So CPO is invincible for the Chelsea fans so I'll tell them now, if you haven't bought a share yet, buy one or more. Make sure to Sanford Bridge is owned forever by the fans. And you'll, because people will all be after it, because that's a valuable piece of land. Yeah. But it can't be as valuable as it is to generations of Chelsea fans. Can you tell us about the song you wrote for Ken? After we'd done Blue Day, obviously I kept in touch with Ken, he liked the song and he'd put it up Chelsea, Chelsea across the West End and stuff like that and he um, uh, so yes, I had lunch with him a couple of times so I got to know Susanna I, uh, his wife and Susanna called me and said um, it's Ken's 70th coming up which was in 2001 um, would you um, would you write a song for his birthday his 70th birthday and i said yeah sure i'd love to i said um you know need some help about <clears throat> direction and lyrics and everything and she came up with this title um um who would have believed basically who would have believed him buying the club for a pound in 20 years could turn it around into a european you know winning side which he did and so we worked together on the lyrics and um, I completed the song and it was only shown ever once at his 70th birthday. And I wasn't, I wasn't up there for some reason. So only a handful of people ever saw it. And that was the end of it. So um, about, about three months ago, I was um, going through my cellar some tapes and things and I came across this video which I hadn't seen for 20 years and um, I transferred it to um, my computer and the video quality wasn't bad but not great but it was okay but the sound was awful it was really bad so I remixed the song put it put it to the picture and then um, sent it to Ken and Susanna and they loved it and they said um you know his yearly do he said mike we've got to we've got to play it 
we've got to play it. So um, that's what we've been doing today. We've done it twice actually. You know, one for his um, his family and once for the, the the old Chelsea staff today. And no, it was it was it was nice. It was lovely. It was like a lovely. The, the songs I think is really really nice because it, it it is about him and what he what he did what he did for the club. You also wrote Blue Day, another fantastic Chelsea anthem. What can you tell us about that? That was um, in 97. So obviously I'm in music. My two loves music, football. Um, and we we were playing Wimbledon in the semi-final of the FA Cup in 97. And... I just have this feeling we're, well, we're going to beat them. We're going to be in in the in in the cup final. And three years previously, we did make a cup final as well. And our, there was a song then called "Nothing's Going to Stop Us Now," which was the Chelsea song. But the only problem was we were stopped by Man United. That was the exception. They beat us. And it was a time when you know it was fun to have each club had a. FA Cup final song so it was, it was it was and that was fun competition who'd get higher in the charts that you know that competition was fun as well and I had this song ready um, and when we beat Wimbledon um, I sent it off to uh, three record companies and I heard back from two within an hour um, it's unusual for a record company to call you back and one of them was Warner's and they called back a girl called Barbara Sharon, who is quite associated with the club. I didn't know that at the time. And she said, Mike, just heard your song. Um, she said, but we've got a problem. And I said, what's, what's the problem? Well, she said, um, we've already got the Chelsea FA Cup final song. So I said, well, why have you called me? She said, because we like yours better. <laughs> so... She said um, in the next place, do you mind if Sug sings it? So I said, no, nah, get lost. No, I said, yeah, yeah. Um, of course. And the next day, Suggs was in the studio, came down to our studios in Carnaby Street, and he'd learnt the song and was with him a couple of hours. And then we went off round Soho to different drinking establishments that he knew one when one finished at, half 10 or 11 he knew another one was up to half 11 and another one opened to 12 and he took me around all these places that he knew and um we were just talking chelsea chelsea all the way all the night yeah, and uh, yeah and then that was nice and kept in touch with him and he asked me to write a couple of songs for his solo album with him so that that was fun so it's funny how one thing can lead to another so it's quite nice is all the people behind the scenes who don't ever get thanked and never in the public domain have done a great job Suggs and a Chelsea song that's a match made in heaven isn't it and I mean he often says when people in interviews when he gets asked um, you know what's your best moment you know your, your favourite record you know and, it, and he says it's not a mag madness song he says it's Blue Day he says because it's it's in his heart the lyrics were you know I mean, I wrote them from the heart because I'm a Chelsea fan. Mm. And, you know, those opening lines, that every Chelsea fan could associate with it, you know, with our ups and downs. that We'd always moan about Chelsea, you know, and then that cup final really started the turnaround. You know, with Ken bringing in Glenn Hoddle, I think, in 94, was it, or whenever. That, that, that was the start of things. And then Hoddle allowed... Brought in Jochulit, who brought in Viali, brought in Zola, and then 
but Ken started it. Ken started it all, you know, so it's, um, no, it's great times, great memories. Was you actually with the players when you recorded the song? Yeah, so I recorded the song and then I had my friend, Keith Summers, who actually sang Blue Tomorrow, which was the follow up. And then he also sang Ken Bates' song, Who Would Have Believed. Um, oh, Keith. Yeah, it's, it's, if you hear, you'll hear his voice. It's the same, and 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 Keith was on backing vocals for, for uh, Blue Day as well. But um, so the track, I finished the track, but I needed to put on the Chelsea team. Um, needed to put on brass section and cello uh, quartet section. So we went over to a studio which was where I think Madness used to record, which was in uh, in West London. And I've forgotten the name of the studio, but it's Notting Hill area. Um, West something, West Side, is it? West Side Studio or something like that. And we got there and we recorded the brass and the quartet first, and then the players came in and they, I don't know if it was the first time I'd heard it or not, but I mean, it wasn't too tricky to sing along to. And we held up big signs for the words and they, they were great. They were absolutely brilliant. It was a great day. And the funniest part for me was, um, bless him, Gianluca Viali, who, um, was, he was always dressed he always dressed like a gentleman you know he was always you know the typical italian like well to do and uh, but funny as well and but all the players were quite casual except he was in his suit and everything and there was a section at the end of the song where um each player took it i i, I added the night before this extra section on the end of the um of the song where all the players would come up and sing you um it's going to be blue. They all took it in turns and it worked out really well. Except when it got to Gianluca's bit, he came up and he doing his jacket and stuff. He comes up and the tape stopped because we'd run out of tape by then. And the whole, uh, the rest of the players just creased up laughing. And he just carried on as normal. He just, he sort of just laughed, took a bow, said, yeah, you know, and then we did it again with him on it. But it, yeah, it was, it was a great time. Blue tomorrow. Possibly I prefer that to Blue Day. I do really like that song, actually, Blue Tomorrow. I think it's fantastic. I use it in my podcast, uh, Chelsea FC. Uh, it's an intro to my podcast. I really like that one. Oh, OK, yeah. Yeah, I think um, possibly the chorus was a bit too high for the players in retrospect, but I think we did it quite quickly. But it was... Um, uh, Keith could sing it. He, he, he was fine with it, and it was really... Funny, again, that was a fantastic recording session because the players came again and Zolo was there and then he sat next to me on the piano and he said, hey, Mike, can you teach me the song? So I started, mind you, he did it in a proper Italian accent. Okay. And he started playing, I started showing the end bit, Chelsea, Chelsea, Chelsea is the way. And I showed him the chords and then he started playing it and he was, he was absolutely brilliant. So, um, you know, I didn't realise he was such a good, he was such a good musician. And I'm looking at this guy who's, how tall is he? I think he was smaller than me. So I'm small. I'm about five, seven and a half. He's five, five, six and a half. How tall is he? I mean, he was tiny. He was, he, I mean, and I'm looking at this guy and standing, I'm thinking, how can you be such a brilliant player? He's just tiny. And I think, what is it? What, you know? It's in, and he he was a, he was a genius. He was absolute genius, and he could play the piano. Very talented man. Thank you very much. And this is our annual get together of the Great Days. Yeah. 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 Yeah.